Welcome, this is Mara and Ben for Stellar Strategy Gaming, and today we're going to be talking about how to set up your campaign setting. We do how-to videos for Dungeon Masters and players. We upload at least once a week, so if you enjoyed this video, please press like. If you'd like to see more, please subscribe. We're always interested in your comments, especially if you have ideas for videos you would like to see. When we talk about the campaign setting, of course, we're talking about where your campaign happens. Is it a generic Forgotten Realms type setting? Are you playing on some other plane of existence? And specifically, we're going to talk about how to do this in such a way that you're not just reskinning the buildings, the NPCs, the big bads, etc. Because I've just seen too many of these where you're essentially fighting goblins that don't look like goblins because the setting is Avernus or whatever. Oh, yes. And actually, before I get to my main point about Fantasy NYC, I do want to expand upon that a bit with just... I have played in multiple campaigns that are theoretically supposed to take place on other planes, and what inevitably happens is it feels more like you're walking in a dream than you're walking on another plane. Mm -hmm. Because it, when you dream, it's you in a void, usually. It's you in some sort of murky void with other things happening around you. Now, the reason why I bring that up is because... For example, Mechanus is a big city, which actually also fits into my NYC point, but if you don't describe Mechanus for your players who've probably never read the lore, it's just going to be, again, a murky void with generally mechanical things happening in the background. So that is also something important, is just description, description, description. Make sure that if you're writing about Mechanus, you're describing the city of Mechanus. You're not just saying, you are on Mechanus now, and then continue it. But that also gets to... My reskinning of NPCs, for, or N NYC for those who like to describe their cities in a little more detail, is both myself and Ben have played in multiple campaigns where we are in this beautiful fantasy city, and it is diverse and interesting and local, and it is basically just fantasy NYC. Please don't do that. Like, if you, even if you are intentionally basing it off of a major city, add a few quirks that make it not fantasy London or fantasy Berlin, add a unique race to that place, add unique languages, add a local culture. Yes. So when I traveled in Italy, I got to stay in many different Italian cities and they were all slightly different from each other. For example, Florence is not that big of a city. There is a river that cuts through the middle of the city, but it's not nearly the size of any of the rivers that go through NYC. Whereas in Venice, you have many canals, and that very much affects the layout of the city. It affects how you get around. And even in a medieval fantasy setting, for example, you wouldn't really be able to get around up by horseback in a town like that, and there wouldn't be horse-drawn wagons going by. Everything goes by on boats, and the city always smells of salt water. And the buildings have corrosion of the brickwork and masonry because of the salt air. So you don't necessarily need to go into a tremendous amount of detail. Just give some detail that separates this city from literally every other fantasy city. <laughs> and give some detail that separates the people. When I traveled from southern Italy to northern Italy, the people looked very different. And the further south in Italy you go, the more Mediterranean the people you look. When you go to northern Italy, you have people who look distinctly German. So even within an elvish kingdom, you know, maybe if you're going from a part at the center of the kingdom where everybody's a high elf and you get out to the outlands of the kingdom, maybe you have elves who are are wood elves and they're a little bit grimier, a little bit more comfortable being a little bit grimier. Maybe you have some elves who look like they have some orcish heritage, you know, go wild with that and and really give it some variation and some diversity. Yes, and to focus on the city itself a bit, I'm going to use an example of a more recently created city of mine, which is a, it's a city called the City of Light for a minor role-playing game I'm doing, whereby it is built on top of a mesa, which means that as my dad ex, uh, explained, it will have some unique geographical features. For one, the breeze is always very cool. Uh, so even though it's built in a desert, it's actually comfortable to live there because of that. And in fact, that sort of moves on to what I suspect Ben is about to talk about and what I'm going to talk about, which is also, you have to be realistic about your setting in the sense of where you are. Because 
there's not just going to be a city in the middle of the desert with no major resources and no major source of water. There has to be either something that makes it comfortable to live in a desert or a source of water that makes it tolerable to do so. Yes, and it's also important that as your players travel throughout their world, their world is going to have places that feel very different and may feel unfamiliar and it gets even more so if you're doing a campaign where you're getting into different realms of existence. When I was 14 my father had the idea of having us go camping in the Ozarks Mountains in southern Missouri. Then as now I am lost the moment I leave pavement and in this particular camping trip it was colder than we had expected it to be and there had been a drought so the creeks were all dry which basically means we spent a weekend freezing and unable to bathe. It was tons of fun. I can imagine. Point is, there were no goblins trying to kill us. There was no magical aura affecting our ability to survive. And even with that, just being in an unfamiliar setting, it really did change the overall feel of, of life. And it really it was really a, a shocking and difficult adjustment, even for those few days. And now granted, your party of adventurers are not going to be 14 year old city slickers who can't handle themselves. But think about what is going to be different and challenging when your players travel to different fantasy settings. For example, if your players are going to the Feywild, the Feywild is a very magical place where a lot of the laws of time, distance, and just cause and effect don't really apply. I ran a campaign that was a Feywild campaign, and one of the things I did was I had time act a little bit differently in the Feywild. It didn't affect the storyline that much, but I had a character get separated from the party. The character was lost for a few days. They sort of lost, I just narrated, they lost track of time, they had to stop and rest a few times, and then they did eventually find the party after what seemed like at least a few days. For the party, it had been about 10 minutes. And I threw in a few little events like that. It promoted a feeling of this being an alien place. It promoted the feeling of this being a place that was not necessarily hostile, but that was fundamentally unsafe. Yes. Now, that actually leads a bit into my point, which is also on consistency of your setting. And I'm going to give you one example of consistency done well and one example of consistency done very, very poorly. The example of consistency done well is in the Magic the Gathering plane, whereby at one point it is always day, and then it becomes always night and transforms into a literally different world. I'm unfortunately forgetting what the plane is. Lorwyn. Lorwyn, thank you. Uh, Lorwyn and Shadowwyn, right? Uh, yes. So that is an example of consistency done well, because you're not going to find a dark fairy wandering around in Lorwyn. You're going to find a dark fairy traveling in Shadowwyn. And in fact, it, that it remained remarkably consistent throughout is... When, for example, the Queen of the Fairy changed the entire world to the Shadowfell, uh, theoretically forever, though it didn't last that long, there wasn't a bunch of people who protested and stayed bright. Everyone did become the darker versions of themselves, uh, despite it being an unwilling change, because that was the rule of the world. Whereas a example of consistency done very poorly is in a campaign that we have actually referenced on this channel before, I believe, called Vix Desert Campaign, which, first off, if you want to not, not annoy your players, do what you say you're going to be doing when you're DMing. We covered that in our last video. But also, for Vix Desert Campaign, they decided that uh, there should be random bones in the desert, which threw me off a little bit because there were bones of a dragon. So it suggested to me, oh, well, these might turn into a Draco Lich or something. Uh, or there might be a civilization around them. Like, there were a lot of different ways to go with that. But then we found ruins that were almost Greco-Roman in style. So I was getting very mixed messages there. And among all of the many other things I didn't particularly like about that session, it really threw me off. It, it pulled me out of the setting so repeatedly I could never get into the world. So to give an example that might be a little bit more familiar to the audience, the second Avengers movie, Avengers The Age of Ultron. Oh, God. Yes. For example, there was a scene in Avengers Age of Ultron where 
the guy with the bow, Hawkeye, pulls Scarlet Witch aside and narrates how ridiculous the setting is. It it didn't it didn't add anything. It didn't really increase immersion. It actually broke immersion. And in, in the opening battle scene, which I guess we're supposed to be able to, to take seriously, somebody swears, Captain America says language, which you're being shot at and you're addressing language. And this is somebody who, he's Captain America, he's been in the army, he's been in combat. And we have Iron Man saying, is anyone going to address the fact that Captain America said language? It just, it takes you so far out of what should be a serious scene and if the whole movie had been like that, it would have been okay if it had been like, for example, Deadpool, where he never stops quipping and third wall breaking. It would have been fine, but Avengers Age of Ultron was trying to be a somewhat serious superhero movie, and so there was no consistency of the tone. Yes, and so for a few things there, uh, one is that I am very glad with how Marvel sort of changed to become more comedic over time. While Endgame was a very serious movie, by comparison, it was still much more humorous than the original Avengers in many ways. Um, and similarly, that actually gets to my next point, which is when you go off the beaten path for consistency, which is bound to happen, that is an inevitability in everyone's campaign, no matter how much of, a ser how much of an experienced and serious DM they are, for example, the Bravinio session we've referenced previously where a bunch of random stuff happened for no reason, what you have to do is you have to force yourself to get back on track. This works better with comedies than it does with tragedies. And I'm going and a good reference that I like to use is the final episode of Adventure Time. The Lich King, who's been a reoccurring villain throughout, goes on his great monologue, uh, which is incredibly grim and about destroying the world, and doesn't fit Adventure Time. And so what Finn does is he just punches him in the face mid-conversation. And that's hilarious. And it forces the entire storyline back to get to the that comedic consistency where whereas in again uh, avengers age of ultron it's much harder to start out comedic and then flip back to serious even if even if they had committed to it it's very hard to force yourself to stay back on track with that and it requires much more skill and patience absolutely now it is entirely possible to write changes in tone into your storyline especially if you're doing things where the party is moving to different planes of existence and this is something where the lore and the rules can really help you. In the lore of D&D, if you have something like a cleric or a warlock where they're drawing power from another being, as they move closer to that being, they become more powerful. As they move further away, they become less powerful. So if you have in your storyline that the party is fighting some sort of a demon lord from the abyss and they're eventually going to need to go to the abyss and defeat them something you could do early on in the game is have them get dropped in a little side quest where they they are dumped into the abyss and have to find their way back out but your cleric your paladin and depending on the warlock's patron possibly even the warlock are less powerful their spells are depowered that gives a real sense of even if we get to a high level, are we really going to be able to function in the setting? And it, and it causes the party to really interact. If the cleric spells are depowered by a level or two, does the cleric need to take levels in something else? Does the cleric need to find some sort of magical artifact that they can bring to the abyss with them that will connect them to their deity? In addition, if you're dealing with a situation like what we discussed in our BBEG videos, which you should definitely watch, where a, an elder evil is starting to manifest, if one of your players happens to be a warlock of, let's say, Hadar, maybe their spells start becoming more powerful as Hadar becomes closer to manifesting. And that becomes a very interesting situation for your warlock. If Hadar makes it close to this to this universe if, if i let hadar eat a couple of prime material worlds i become a level 20 warlock even though i'm level five you know that might be a, a thing your your character is perfectly fine with and that's an excellent opportunity from this from immersive role play and it lets the players help you set up the setting yes and on top of that it's also very key to really Always remember what you have going on in the background of a setting if you're going for something that big, you know, because being in 
fantasy New York City is a very different matter from fighting off an elder evil, you know? So not only do you have to be consistent, which I keep hearkening back to, but also you have to uh, remember exactly what's going on so you don't get out of scale with your consistency. If you're serious, but you introduce Emrukiel the Aeon's Torn into your campaign about fighting a bunch of goblins, no one's going to take it seriously anymore, so you have to account for that, or you have to figure out a way to gradually introduce that elder evil, you know? And the same goes for the opposite. If you're fighting Emrukiel the Aeon's Torn, and you go fight a bunch of random goblins, and that's all you spend your time doing, Again, no one's going to take the Emrukiel threat seriously because for some reason her minions are level 1 goblins. One, one series that does an excellent job of maintaining the kind of consistency being discussed is the Castlevania anime series. It takes place in a very grim, bleak world. Dracula is the big bad, at least for the first season. What's interesting about it, though, is that Dracula is not the way the world is the way it is. The world just is the way it is. And all of the characters, big and small, are trying to survive in this bleak world. So even the sort of low-level thugs, essentially, they fit into the world. And so it's a, it's a natural scaling from the thugs to the undead creatures to the vampires. It all makes sense within that world. That is extremely important. And in order for things to, to make sense, you have to, especially with the flow of magic and especially with how NPCs act, you, you want everything to kind of flow. So if you're in the Feywild, everything you encounter is going to be to some extent magical. And like, we're, we're, we're out of rations. We're going to go hunting. Oh, there's a deer. I'm going to shoot this deer. Oh, that's cool. The deer knows Eldritch Blast because it <laughs> gathered, the, maybe not that specifically, but you get the idea. Or, you know, oh, there's a bunch of cute little squirrels here. Wow, there's a lot of cute little, these squirrels are carnivorous. This is great. There are enough of them here to do 13 points of damage to my Amrukiel, the Aeon's Tord. <laughs> uh, so, you know, so you, you keep that going in there and, and getting back to the thing with magic. If you're in something like the Feywild, Go crazy with having your druid and your ranger even be overpowered. You know, maybe the ranger casts Hail of Thorns and a significant portion of the forest looks like a tornado hit it. So now you've got a problem of the players aren't even necessarily in control of their spells. Same way a death domain cleric goes to the Shadowfell, they cast a spell and all of a sudden it's, it's just completely out of control. Use your imagination. Make this world work. Based and, and make it interact with your characters. That's something that's very important that often gets missed, is your characters are part of the world, and the way they interact with it is an important part of how the, of the tone and pace of the setting. Oh, yes, uh, and that actually brings me to one of two points I'd like to make, which is the first being that uh, if you're thinking about doing a Shadowfell versus Feywild campaign, getting back to that tone and such... I just want to give a little recommendation, which is if you think, oh, well, I'll have it be there based on their emotions and such. The, the, the plane of darkness is not the plane where your Sith character is going to shine, and the plane of light, or Feywilds, if you want to call it that, is not going to be the plane where your Jedi character shines. If anything, it's the opposite, because the Feywilds is the land of emotion. It's the land of raw, unbridled chaos, which is much better for a Sith, so on. And that's just a very good example because of how black and white the Sith versus Jedi conflict is. Um, but also moving on to my second point about the players, as mentioned, uh, when you have your Session Zero, which we truly just love to talk about because session zero is so important for a campaign make sure everyone's on track with their characters if you have a character who is a level 20 bard who is going to cast wish cast wish at every opportunity to cause just absolute chaos and you are in the curse of strahd world we might have a problem yes now Always remember, you can use your imagination, you can vary these recommendations, make it your own. I do agree with a lot of what Mara is saying, but it's certainly possible for a Jedi to shine in the Feywild and a Sith to shine in the Shadowfell. Only a Sith deals in absolutes. <laughs> I hate that phrase so much. You and everyone else. <laughs>
Mara is absolutely right. Part of it has to be the kind of character you play. I have a character who is a bard who speaks in rhyme, and yes, I do act that out when I play the character. That really isn't the right character for the tone of Curse of Strahd. Similarly, if you're playing a warlock of Cthulhu and your campaign is taking quite place in Equestria, you're probably not going to have a good time, although I could see some opportunities for some, for some fun role play with that. Point is, though, it really does fall on the players. If you're constantly quipping, if you're constantly making bad jokes, if you're constantly just not there with it for whatever the DM's trying to do, or the opposite, if you're trying to murder hobo everything you see while you're in, the, in Adventure Time or Equestria or wherever, that doesn't fit with the campaign and you're going to derail it and it's not going to be a good time for anybody. Once again, thank you so much for listening and watching. Your likes, comments, subscribe, shares, all that tasty goodness really do help us out. It really, it really does mean a lot to us. As a creative type, you often don't get the chance to... It often feels like you're sort of screaming into the void. It's hard to find venues where you get feedback, so we really appreciate this. Yes, and uh, if you are interested in f uh, our future videos, next uh, the next video we'll have coming up is Bards and Rangers and some of the issues and some of the strengths that they have. And also, if you are interested in some of the historical references we made, we will be getting up our history channel called Echoes of History very soon, If any, and when it's up, I'll link it in the description below.